Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Oppenheimer live stream. So today I am back in the library at a study room, and today might have to be a bit of a quicker stream because I forgot to bring my laptop charger. And OBS is a pretty uh, CPU intensive uh, program. So yeah, I apologize for uh, being like 30 minutes ahead of schedule uh, and all that, but basically it is raining cats and dogs out there, so I can't go back to my dorm room to get my, uh, my charger. So I'm just going to go ahead with it. So today I am again in the library, and I don't know if the Wi-Fi is going to be good, so uh, I've just decided to ignore that because I'm recording today. So uh, if there are problems, I can go back and just upload this as a uh, VOD. Uh, like as a separate video on its own. So that should cover that. Um, also, I'm kind of regretting my choice of study room right now. Okay. I chose a study room that has like four, four seats, right? So it's like meant for collaboration or something, but it's right next to the zone of the library that's designated quiet study. So I hope that this room is soundproof because I don't feel too good about a uh, distracting people if they're studying. Also, this room has like a giant glass window. I don't know if you can see that. So I feel very exposed. I don't know. It's funny. I mean, obviously I'm streaming to an audience and I make videos for a large audience, but it feels weird to have an actual audience right now. But anyway, before my computer runs out of battery, let's just get on with more Oppenheimer. So today is Wednesday, the 14th of April, 1954. And Oppenheimer is still, you know, on trial. I mean, not trial trial, but, you know, fake uh, trial. Okay, security hearing trial. Um, and today should be interesting. They talk about Oppenheimer's brother. So, yeah, so let's just dive right into that. Um, I will quickly check that the audio is good. Let me just hop over to the video on YouTube. Um, oh yeah, also I've noticed I've gotten a lot of subscribers recently. Uh, and if any of them are watching, hey, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, uh, thank you for subscribing. And if you're not subscribed yet, you should totally uh, like and subscribe right now. Uh, and yeah, so. Okay, audio is fine. So let's just get started. All right. Okay. Dr. Gray, or Mr. Gray, says the presentation will begin. Whereupon. J. Robert Oppenheimer, the witness on the stand at the time of taking the recess, resumed the stand and testified further as follows. Dr. Oppenheimer, will you tell the board something about your brother Frank, your relationship with him? He was eight years my junior. It was just you and Frank in the family? We were the only children. I think I was both an older brother and in some ways perhaps part of a father to him because of that age difference. We were close during our childhood, although the age gap made our interests different. We sailed together. We bicycled together. In 1929, we rented a little ranch up in the high mountains in New Mexico, which we have had ever since, and we used to spend as much time there as we could in the summer. For my part, that was partly for reasons of health, but it was also a very nice place. My, br my brother had learned to be a very expert flutist. I think he could have been a professional. He decided to study physics. Since I was a physicist, this produced a kind of rivalry. He went abroad to study. He studied at Cambridge and at Florence. He went to college before that at Johns Hopkins. So that's interesting. They don't talk about him playing the flute in the movie. Um, anyway. When he came back to this country, he did take his doctor's degree at the California Institute of Technology. We were quite close, very fond of one another. He was not a very disciplined young man. 
I guess I was not either. He loved painting. He loved music. He was an expert horseman. We spent most of our time during the summer fiddling around with horses and fixing up the ranch. In the very first year, he had two young friends with whom, uh, with him who were about his age, and I was the old man of the party. He read quite widely, but I am afraid very much as I did Bellistress poetry. Um, he read quite widely, but I am afraid very much as I did. Yeah, I'm not. Bellistress poetry. I, I don't know what that is, Bellistress. Um, anyway. And Dr. Evans interjects, he says, was your father there at the time? My father was alive. He did occasionally visit at the ranch. His heart was not very good. This is almost 10,000 feet high, so he did not spend much time there. We could not put him up. It was a very primitive sort of establishment. There was, of course, the tension which a very intimate family relation of this kind always involves, but there was great affection between us. He worked fairly well at physics, but he was slow. It took him a long time to get his doctor's degree. He was very much distracted by his other interests. In 1936, I guess it was, he met his present wife and married. I am not completely sure of the date, but I could check it. After that, a good deal of the warmth of our relations remained, but they were less intimate and occasionally perhaps somewhat more strained. His wife had, I think, some friends and connections with the radical circles in Berkeley. She was a student there. She had a very different background than Frank. She certainly interested him for the first time in politics and left-wing things. It was a great bond between them. As I wrote in my answer, not very long after their marriage, they both joined the Communist Party. This was in Pasadena. I don't know how long thereafter, but not very long thereafter, Frank came to Berkeley and told me of this. We continued to be close as brothers are, but not as it had been before his marriage. He once asked me and another fellow to come visit one of the meetings that he had in his house, which was a Communist Party meeting. It is, I think, the only thing recognizable to me as a Communist Party meeting that I have ever attended. I'm sorry, could we go back to where the doctor said he once asked me? I did not get the rest of the words. And another fellow, I would be glad to identify him, but he is not alive and not involved in the case. I'm not sure what went on there, <laughs> that little interaction. Um, anyway, then Garrison asks, this was a professor? Was that Dr. Addis? No, this was Calvin Bridges, a geneticist at Caltech, and a very distinguished man, not a communist as far as I know. This was not a closed meeting of the Communist Party. It was not closed because it had visitors. I understood the rest of the people were communists. This was on the occasion of one of my visits to Berkeley and Pasadena. The meeting made no detailed impression on me, but I do remember there was a lot of fuss about getting the literature distributed, and I do remember that the principal item under discussion was segregation in the municipal pool in Pasadena. This unit was concerned about that, and they talked about it. It made a rather pathetic impression on me. It was a mixed unit of some colored people and some who were not colored. I remember vividly walking away from the meeting with Bridges and, it, and his saying, what a sad spectacle, or what a pathetic sight, or something like that. Uh, so that's interesting right there that they were campaigning um, like against segregation uh, because California was a free state during the Civil War, so I didn't know how much, uh, like to what extent they had uh, Jim Crow laws in California, but it sounds like they had some, at least based on uh, what they were protesting against here. Anyway, um, Mr. Gray says, oh wait, sorry. Oh uh, yeah, he says, uh, did you give the approximate date of this? I can give it roughly. I mean, within a year. It would have been not before 1937 or after 1939. I think I ought to stress that although my brother was a party member, he did a lot of other things. As I say, he was passionately fond of music. He had many wholly non-communist friends, some of them the same as my friends, on the faculty at Caltech. He was working for a doctor's degree. 
He spent summers at the ranch. He couldn't have been a very hard-working communist during those years. I am very foggy as to what I knew about the situation at Stanford, but my recollection is that I did not then know my brother was still in the party. He has testified that he was and that he withdrew in the spring of 1941. He lost his job at Stanford. I never clearly understood the reasons for that, but I thought it might be connected with his communism. We spent part of the summer of 1941 together at the ranch about a month. That was after my marriage. He and his wife stayed on a while. Then they were out of a job. Ernest Lawrence asked him to come to Berkeley in the fall. I don't remember the date, but I think it is of record and work in the lab in the radiation laboratory. This was certainly at the time not for secret work. He and I saw very little of each other that year. My brother felt that he wanted to establish an independent existence in Berkeley where I had lived a long time and didn't want in any sense to be my satellite. He did become involved in secret work, I suppose, shortly after Pearl Harbor. I don't know the precise date. He continued with it and worked terribly hard during the war. I have heard a great many people tell me what a vigorous and helpful guy he was, how many hours he spent at work, how he got everybody to put their best to their best to the job, that was his. He worked in Berkeley, he worked in Oak Ridge. He came for a relatively brief time to New Mexico where his job was as an assistant to Bainbridge in making the preparations for the test of July 16. That would be the Trinity test um, that he's talking about. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention at the start, feel free to leave any uh, questions you have for me in the chat. Anyway, This was a job that combined practical experience, technical experience, a feeling for the country, and I think he did very well. He left very early, left long before I did, and went back to Berkeley. He did not, we did not see him again until the New Year's holidays in 1945 and 46. After that, when we came back to Berkeley, he saw something of them, quite a little of them, until they moved to Minnesota. As you probably know, he resigned from the University of Minnesota his assistant professorship there, in the spring of 1949, at the time he was testifying before the House Committee that he had been a member of the Communist Party. The university accepted his re resignation. He has not been able to get a job since, or at least not one that made sense. He had in the summer of 1948, maybe, or the winter of 1948-49, acquired a piece of property in southwest Colorado. It is also fairly high. It is in the Blanco Basin, I think he got it because it was very beautiful and thought it would be nice to spend summers there. In any case, he and his wife and children moved up there and have been trying to build it up as a cattle ranch ever since. They have been there, I think, with no important exceptions from 1949 until today. This life is not what he was cut out for, and I don't know how it will go. I try to see him when I can. It does not come out to being much more than once a year. I think the last time I saw him was in late September or October of last year. Usually he would come down to Santa Fe and we would have an evening together or something like that. I had the feeling the last time that I saw him that he was thoroughly and wholly and absolutely away from this nightmare which has been going on for many, many years. These are at least some of the things that I wanted to say. I would like to say one more thing. In the commission's letter, Perhaps I could ask you about that. On page six of the commission's letter, which talks about Hacken Chevalier, there is a statement, I am quoting, that Hacken Chevalier thereupon approached you either directly or through your brother, Frank Friedman Oppenheimer, in connection with this matter. Was your brother connected with this approach by Chevalier to you? I'm very clear on this. I have a vivid and I think certainly not fallible memory. He had nothing whatever to do with it. It would not have made any sense, I may say, since Chevalier was my friend. I don't mean that my brother did not know him, but this would have been a peculiarly, peculiarly roundabout and unnatural thing. And that makes sense just based on the movie. In the movie, um, I guess, you know, we don't necessarily know for sure, but in the movie, uh, Chevalier approaches him directly to talk about, you know, getting information to Russia through unofficial means rather than through Frank. Um, 
And that does make sense because, again, in the movie, it shows that like Oppenheimer is or Robert is closer to Chevalier than Frank is because, uh, you know, Robert has him like babysit his kids and stuff like that. So. Um, so, yeah, I would tend to believe that testimony, I guess. I mean, well, again, the movie's probably based on the testimony. So, uh, you know, who's to say? But uh, we're just taking this at face value, right? Anyway. You spoke about attending at your brother's invitation that little Communist Party meeting in Pasadena somewhere in the late 30s. And that reminds me to ask you about another portion of the commission's letter. On page three, I will just read a paragraph. It was reported that you attended a closed meeting of the professional section of the Communist Party of Alameda County, California, which was held in the latter part of July or early August 1941 at your residence, 10 Kenilworth Court, Berkeley, California, for the purpose of hearing an explanation of the change in Communist Party policy. It was further reported that you denied that you attended such a meeting and that such a meeting was held in your house, in your home. Dr. Oppenheimer, did you attend a closed meeting of the professional section of the Communist Party of Alameda County, which is said to have been held in your house in the later part of July or early August 1941? No. Did you ever attend at any time or place a closed meeting of the professional section of the Communist Party of Alameda County? No. Were you ever asked to lend your house for such a meeting? No. Did you ever belong to the professional section of the Communist Party of Alameda County? Uh, I did not. I would be fairly certain that I never knew of its existence. Did you ever belong to any other section or unit of the Communist Party or to the Communist Party? No. Apart from the meeting in Pas Pasadena, to which we have just referred, have you ever attended a meeting which you understood to be open only to Communist Party members, other than yourself? No. Have you ever had in your house at any time any meeting at which a lecture about the Communist Party has been given? No. To sum up, Dr. Oppenheimer, do you deny the report set forth on page three of the Commission's letter which I read to you? All but the, de all but the denial. Wait, all but the denial. I deny the rest. Oh, yes. Okay, that makes sense. Um, that's hard to parse there. He says, all but the denial. I deny the rest. Because um, part of... Here, I just... Part of that paragraph above said, you know, you attended this meeting, and then you denied that you attended this meeting. And he's saying... I deny that I attended this meeting, but I don't deny that I denied it because I'm denying it right now. <laughs> it's just complicated legal legal speak kind of thing. Um, oh, I got a chat. Someone said that's Nick says, greetings, people of Earth. Hello, Nick. Are you an alien? Are you the alien that they found in Mexico? <laughs> I've seen so many memes about that. Um, it looks like a movie prop, I have to say. Like, it looks like exactly what you would think an alien would look like based on, like, a sci-fi movie. So, I really, I really don't believe it, frankly. Um, I could get into that, but I'm not sure that's what you were referencing when you said greetings, people of Earth, but, uh, that's just what that made me think of. Anyway, okay, so... Just so the board understands, I read the statement to Dr. Oppenheimer. It was further reported that you attended such a meeting and that such a meeting was held in your home. That I don't deny. The first sentence of the report you do deny. Yes. I would like to introduce, Mr. Chairman, at this point, copies of correspondence relating to the Independent Citizens Committee of the Arts, Sciences, and Professions, which is mentioned in the Commission's letter on page 6, which reads that it was reported in 1946 that you, that is Dr. Oppenheimer, were listed as Vice Chairman on the letter board of the Independent Citizens Committee of the Arts, Sciences, and Professions Incorporated, which has been cited as a communist front by the House Un-American Un Activities Committee. 
I think in my earlier discussion with the board, I pointed out that in all the post-war period, this is the only association cited by the House Committee, or in any other way, challenged by any group in the government as un-American, with which Dr. Oppenheimer had any connection at all. I now would like to introduce the correspondence which will show his resignation and his relationship to that committee, which I think the board will agree was to his credit. I would like to read these into the record. Dr. Oppenheimer, I have here carbon copies of letters from you to the Independent Citizens Committee dated October 11th, 1945, October 11th, 1946, November 22nd, 1946 is an original letter from the committee to you, followed by Carbon of December 2, 1946, from you to them, and an original from the secretary to you of December 10, 1946. Do you identify these as having been in your files? Yes, these were in my file, and I made them available to you. It's actually gray. Mr. Garrison, I think perhaps for the record, at least what we have been handed reflects nothing dated 1945. In your characterization of these documents, you said a letter of October something 1945. Excuse me, that is because it is a fuzzy date on the carbon. It is my fuzziness, Mr. Chairman. The carbon shows it 1946. I'm just trying to get the record straight. I regret my eyesight was not equal to the carbon. This first letter reads as follows. The letter of October 11th, 1946 to the committee. Independent Citizens Committee of the Arts, Sciences, and Professions. Hotel Astor, New York, 17, New York. Gentlemen, some months ago, I was elected a vice chairman of the ICC ASP. This has not been a very arduous responsibility since I have had virtually no contact with the organization. I have, however, noted with a growing uneasiness over the past months, ICC ASP's statements on foreign policy. As examples, I may quote two programmatic statements of the ICC ASP policy. Maintain the big power veto in the Security Council and withdraw US troops from China. I do not wish to challenge the merits of the arguments that may be advanced for these, for these two theses. They do not seem to me, at least in this bald form, to correspond to the extension of President Roosevelt's foreign policy, nor am I in accord with them. Most recently, I have noted in the papers an item which disturbs me more, because it concerns the problem of atomic energy, with the outlines of which I am not unfamiliar, and for which I may even have a certain responsibility. I am of course aware that newspaper comments may often be misleading. As I understand it, the ICC ASP at a recent convention in Chicago agreed to endorse the criticism of U.S. policy and procedure enunciated by Secretary Wallace in his letter to the President of July 23rd. Here again, I should not wish to argue that there was nothing sound in Mr. Wallace's comments, nor for a moment to cast doubt on the validity of his great sense of concern that a satisfactory solution for the control of atomic energy be achieved. But I cannot convince myself that in the large, the suggestions made by Mr. Wallace would, if adopted, advance this great cause. And above all, I feel that the evidence which is now available, and which goes beyond that which was available in July 23rd, indicates the illusory nature of his recommendations. It is clear that I should not prejudge the position which the ICC ASP is taking on these many important questions, but unless I am badly misinformed on what that position is, it seems to me that I can no longer remain a vice chairman of that organization. Will you, therefore, accept this letter as a letter of resignation, unless it is clear to you, and you can make it clear to me, that it is based on a misunderstanding of the facts? Sincerely yours, J. Robert Oppenheimer. Then comes the reply from the executive director, signed by Hannah Dorner, the executive director. Independent Citizens Committee of the Arts, Sciences, and Professions Incorporated, 
Hotel Aster, New York, 19, New York, Circle, blah, 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 address, address. Okay, November 22nd, 1946. Joe Davidson, Chairman, Harold L. Ikes, Executive Chairman, Frederick March, Treasurer, Herman Shumlin, Secretary, Hannah Dorner, Executive Director. Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer. Dear Dr. Oppenheimer, Please forgive this delay in answering your letter, but I have been out of town a good deal, and this is the first opportunity I've had. It would come as a great surprise to the members of the board of ICCASP that the organization can be found guilty of any contradiction of President Roosevelt's foreign policy. We have stated repeatedly that the organization, formed initially to re-elect Mr. Roosevelt and then reformed in order to provide a medium through which the members of the arts, sciences, and professions could help to implement and carry out his program. In connection with the two programmatic statements you refer to in your letter, unless I am very much mistaken, the veto power is the core of the post-war foreign policy which Mr. Roosevelt outlined in conjunction with Churchill and Stalin. I don't know what Mr. Roosevelt would have said were he alive today about maintenance of U.S. troops in China. I do know that for years during the war, he refused to send material into China because Chiang Kai-shek was not using it against Japan, but instead saving it for the conflict he is currently engaged in. It is fairly common knowledge that the presence of U.S. troops and American material, materiel, are being used to aid one side against another in a civil war. Without discussing the merits of either side, certainly it would seem that the American position should be one in which a real effort is made to create a democratic China instead of bolstering the position of military feudalism, which Chiang Kai-shek and his supporters represent. I think Madame Sun Yat-sen's position is one which Americans might fairly support, and the presence of our troops in China and our present policy are giving no encouragement to her views and to those Chinese who wish, as she does, for a truly democratic China. So this is interesting. Um, this is the Chinese Civil War that they're talking about here. Um, I didn't know this name before, but I think Chiang Kai-shek was the leader of the... I forget what they were called, but the group that was opposing the communists. So I think they might have been nationalists. I'm not exactly sure what they called themselves, but let's just go with nationalists for now. So the nationalists uh, led by Chiang Kai-shek uh, were fighting in a civil war against Mao uh, and the communists. Uh, obviously, Mao and the communists won, and the uh, nationalist forces fled to Taiwan. And that's actually the current government of Taiwan, is a continuation of that, basically, uh, in, you know, fleeing government of China. So um, that is pretty interesting to me. Um, in fact, for like about 20 years after the Chinese Civil War, the U.S. would not recognize the uh, new government of China, the Maoist government, uh, and instead insisted that the rightful government of China was the government of Taiwan, uh, that being, uh, you know, Chiang Kai-shek and the leaders that followed after him. And that's just sort of an interesting situation because, you know, Taiwan is a pretty small country. It's this one island. Uh, and... Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting how it's like, at one point, like the US was like trying to say, oh yeah, they're actually the real government. Um, obviously, like this was more of a pragmatic thing because the reason that the US did this is that uh, the UN Security Council has five seats and these are just permanent seats. Uh, those are the US, uh, Britain, France, Russia, and China. And so if the U.S. recognized China, the Maoists, uh, the communists, as the government of China, then they would have to give that U.N. seat over to them, uh, where, you know, they wanted to keep it with uh, Taiwan because Taiwan was more friendly to U.S. desires and policy. Uh, and so I believe it was Jimmy Carter uh, in, you know, the 70s who basically stopped that policy and recognized the uh, de facto uh, government of China as the true government, which uh, I think just makes sense from a like 
acknowledging reality perspective, which is like, you know, as much as we may uh, dislike and disapprove of the government of China, they are in control of China at the end of the day. So what can you do about it, right? Um, but yeah, so that's that's just kind of an interesting situation. Obviously, these uh, this uh, you know the ICC ASP, which is designated as a communist front. Um, of course, they're going to be saying during the civil war that they side with the Maoists and not the uh, nationalists or whatever they were. I I forget. Um, and so that that's just interesting because because you know the civil war the chinese civil war i believe started like before they were invaded by japan and so after they were invaded by japan i think it temporarily like abated as they had a common enemy to fight off but then right after world war ii was over it just kicked back up again i'm not uh as well versed in this history as I am with like, you know, European and American history. But, um, but yeah, it is just an interesting situation because if the U S is sending aid to China on paper in the forties, that would be like, well, you know, they're being invaded by Japan and we don't like that because, you know, Japan was being very brutal in their invasion. And so, uh, like against civilians and that's very well documented for world war two. So we would say, you know, we're going to help them fight off the Japanese invasion, which is a pretty easy position to justify to the American people. Uh, but then after the war is over and uh, Chiang Kai-shek starts using that aid to fund his side of the civil war, it becomes harder to justify because then you're just sort of taking sides in a civil war, which uh, people might not agree with as much. Um, although by the by the 50s, you could pretty much support anyone that's any group that's not communist and people would broadly accept that and be okay with that. Um, I mean, obviously there were protests and stuff like the Vietnam war is a good example of this, right? It's just, you know, we sided with whoever's not communist in a given civil war, uh, which it, it has, has some merit, but you know, then there's like, what would often happen with U.S. policy is it's like you've got a non-communist dictator and a communist dictator, and the U.S. is just like, well, let's just go with the non-communist dictator. And it's like, you know, ideally, we wouldn't be siding with any dictators, but it's like, uh, what can you do, right? So anyway, uh, continuing, we're still quoting from the ICC ASP response letter. Okay. You will have seen, I'm sure, a further statement made since that conference on atomic energy by a coordinating committee of the Chicago conference after Mr. Baruch clarified the points raised at the Chicago conference. As you unquestionably know, our science division has been working for some time both in New York and Chicago on an, on an analysis of the atomic energy control program and as yet, the ICC ASP has not adopted a position since we are waiting on the final report of the science division. I assume that as a member of the division, you will receive that report for your comment and criticism. In this letter, I am attempting to answer the issues raised with the hopes that they will clarify our position and that you will find yourself in substantial agreement with us. I realize that it is difficult for some with as many demands upon his time as you to attend meetings of the ICC ASP. It is unfortunate that this is so because you should participate with the rest of us in forming the policy instead of getting it without the benefit of all the full discussion that goes into arriving at these decisions. I hear frequently about how often you are in New York. If you would only let me know about these visits, you could, I'm certain, find a few hours to attend some of these meetings. I'm sure it is quite unnecessary to make the point to you that the fate of a generation or two is being shaped today. The ICC ASP is conscientiously trying to do what it can do to make it a kinder fate. I am certain that all of us individually will disagree with the organization's position on one or two issues from time to time. 
the importance of the committee as a whole, what it has accomplished, and the need for keeping it alive and strong should transcend occasional differences. All of us value your continued association with the organization. Sincerely yours, Hannah Dorner. The reply by Dr. Oppenheimer, dated December 2, 1946, is as follows. Miss Hannah Dorner. Independent Citizens Committee of the Arts, Sciences, and Professions Incorporated. Okay, it's a, another address. I don't need to read the addresses. <laughs> um, anyway, I see the copy which... Oh, this is an aside from Garrison. I see the copy which we have handed the members of the board. Dr. Oppenheimer's signature does not appear, nor does it appear on the carbon, but his initials are on the lower left and that of the typist. Now quoting. Dear Miss Dorner, thank you very much for your letter of November 22, in which you tried to explain to me how poor are the reasons I gave for res resignation from the vice chairmanship of the ICCASP in my letter of October 11. I wish that I might have been convinced by what you wrote, for I share with you an appreciation for the many constructive and decisive things which the ICCASP is doing, and I am quite sure that I should not be moved to resign were it not for two circumstances. One is that I have a somewhat unreal position as vice chairman and might thus be thought to be far more influential and effective in shaping ICCASP policy than I have been uh, or than I am likely to be in the near future. The second is that the matter of atomic energy is one of the very few on which I have more than the vaguest kind of views, is perhaps the only political issue on which I have a limited competence and have in the past borne some responsibility. I find nothing in the record to comfort me in the matter of atomic energy. The press release of the Chicago conference and its subsequent announcement are both very far from my views and were endorsed by ICCASP without qualifications. The last communication that I have received is dated Monday, September 23, and reached me after my letter of resignation. In it, a resolution of the Division of Science and Technology closely parallel to that adopted in Chicago was submi submitted to the Executive Committee of the ICCASP and approved. I have had no further communication since that time either with regard to atomic energy or to the functioning of the science division of the ICCASP, except for the proposed statement on the control of atomic energy, which is undated and which likewise does not represent my views. I therefore feel that it is likely that there is a genuine difference of opinion on this matter between me and the executive committee of the ICCASP. For the reasons stated above, I think it is not proper to continue to serve as vice chairman under these circumstances. I recognize that it is largely my own doing that I have not had a greater part in the formulation of ICCASP policy, but that should be a genuine reason of all of us not to accept a position of apparent responsibility without being willing to make the responsibility real. I should like to take this course of resignation since the alternative to make public my, dissent, my dissident views is repugnant to me and can help neither the ICCASP nor the cause of world peace, which is surely our grandest common aim. I am, therefore, asking you to accept my letter of resignation. Sincerely yours, Oppenheimer. Then the reply from Hannah Dorner. It is the same heading you had before. Yes, it is the same heading as before. The date of this is December 10, 1946. It was on the original and should be on these copies. This is in reply to Dr. Oppenheimer's second letter insisting on resignation, which I have just read to you. Okay, the same long addresses. I'm just going to skip that. Okay, quote, We accept with regret your resignation from the organization. We hope that sometime again in the future you may want to rejoin us. Sincerely yours, Hannah Dorner. Did you ever rejoin the organization, Dr. Oppenheimer? No. Just as a matter of curiosity, did they ever take your name off the letterhead, do you know? They stopped sending me com communications, I don't know. Your name apparently did not appear on these letterheads. We did on the back. There are a lot of names on the back of the original. 
We will hand this to the chairman in just a moment. I am just looking over these names. It shows Joseph E. Davies as the honorary vice chairman. Don't you think he ought to read them all? I think it would be well to read the whole. This is on the back of the letterhead of the ICC ASP. This is the letter of December 10, 1946, accepting with regret Dr. Oppenheimer's resignation from the organization and hoping sometime again the future in the future he may want to rejoin them. Is that the same as the original letter of November 23, 1946? Is that the same list? It appears on superficial observation the same. Mr. Robb, you can examine it at your leisure. I can see no difference. Why don't you let me take one of them, and I will follow as you read, and we will know whether they are the same or not. I am reading from the back of the letterhead, ICC ASP. Okay. Vice Chairman Joseph E. Davies, Honorary. Brig Brigadier General Evans F. Carlson, Norman Corwin, Ruben G. Gustafson, Fiorello H. LaGuardia, J. Robert Oppenheimer, Paul Robeson, Harlow Shapley, Frank Sinatra, Board of Directors. Do you wish the Board of Directors? I think you better read it all. Samuel L. M. Barlow, William Rose. Oh, okay, these are just going to be a bunch of names. Um, Although it is interesting, actually, uh, I will read it, because some of these people are, fa like Frank Sinatra was on there, so this is interesting that this is considered a uh, communist front organization. I feel like it could be that they were just putting a bunch of people on their, uh, like, executive board for, like, just to, like, try and get legitimacy, just, like, throwing shit at celebrities just to see if they'll stick, you know what I mean? Like, that would be like me saying, like, okay, the, you know... Vice President of Graviton Media is Chris Pratt, <laughs> or Robert Downey Jr., uh, and like making a public proclamation like, oh yes, I have a very honorable and huge organization with these people on the board, uh, and you know those people just have never seen it because they're just ignoring me, right? So I don't know if that's what's going on here, or if these people are genuinely intending to be on this list, but I'll read the list because there are some famous names on here. Um, I don't recognize all of them, uh, but I do recognize some of them, and so the others might also be famous, so let me just uh, go through that. Okay, so anyway, Samuel Bar Barlow, William Rose Benet, Leonard Bernstein, Walter Bernstein, Henry Billings, Charles Boyer, Henrietta Buckmaster, Eddie Cantor, Morris Crook, Samuel Corson, John Cromwell, Bosley Cro Crother, Duke Ellington, Howard Fast, Jose Ferrer, Joan Fontaine, Alan Freelan, Dr. Channing Frothingham, a very dear friend of mine from Boston, Massachusetts, a distinguished physician, Dr. Rudolf Gantz, Ben Grauer, Marin Hargrove, Lewis Harris, Moss Hart, Lillian Hellman, John Hershey, Melville Herskovitz, Alan Hickerson, Thorfinn Hognes, Walter Huston, Crockett Johnson, Gene Kelly, Isaac Kohlhoff, Richard Lauterbach, Eugene List, Peter Lyon, John McManus, Florence Eldr Eldridge March, Dorothy Maynor, Stanley Moss, Ernest Pascal, Robert Patterson, I take it that was not the Secretary of War, but I guess we don't know. <laughs> um, anyway. I know nothing about it. I assume it was not. Linus Pauling, Virginia Payne, Dr. John P. Peters, Walter Rottenstruck, Quentin Reynolds, Hazel Scott, A.C. Spektorsky, Carl Van Doren, Orson Welles, and Carl... Zigroser. Then follow a list of region all chapters. Regional chapters. 
There's a bunch of typos in this. Okay, then follow a list of regional chapters. Shall I read those, Mr. Chairman? Is this just the names of cities? Yes, and addresses. I see no point in that. This is not related to the proceeding. But here is an organization accepting the resignation of one of its vice chairmen, and apparently did not bother to strike his name off the letterhead on his letter of resignation. I really think this has no point, but from what I heard, it is very difficult to resign from some of these organizations once one seems to be a member. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of what I was thinking, right? That, that these, that, that they're kind of like scamming you by like giving you a membership, like when you don't want one. It's like, uh, it's like subscribing to like a magazine or something. And it's like, it's impossible to get off of it. And you're like, and they're like, oh, we're so honored to give you the, like, go away. <laughs> uh, anyway. I think you can take judicial notice of the fact that organizations reprint their letterheads at intervals, sometimes at considerable intervals. Mr. Chairman, I might say that the lists were identical, so we have that in the record, too. All right. Dr. Oppenheimer, do you adopt your answer consisting of your letter to Major General K.D. Nichols dated March 4, 1954, as your testimony in this proceeding? Yes. Mr. Chairman, that will be all the questions I wish to ask Dr. Oppenheimer. I may, a little later as we proceed, come back with some occasional questions, perhaps. That will be all at this point. They will be related to questions and discussions which will take place from now on. This is not going to circumscribe you in any way, but I take it Dr. Oppenheimer's presentation, as you see it, and as he sees it, is complete now? Yes. Mr. Chairman, there may be some detail that I have overlooked in the great press of preparing this, which I might at a later stage ask to be inserted in the record, but so far as I am now aware, this completes the direct case. I assume we are not quite so rigid, but what if I have overlooked something? It may be later introduced? Yes. There is no design to do so. I understand. At this point, I think, then, we will suggest that counsel for the board put to Dr. Oppenheimer the questions which he may have in mind. Ooh, okay. So now we're entering the cross-examination. So we're going to get a lot of Roger Robb talk in this guy. Um, remember, this guy goes on to be a D.C. Circuit judge, which is basically one step away from being a Supreme Court judge. Um, so he becomes very prominent. As a, as a judge and a lawyer. Okay. Dr. Oppenheimer, did you prepare your letter of March 4, 1954 to General Nichols? You want a circumstantial account of it? I assume you prepared it with the assistance of counsel, is that correct? Yes. In all events, you were thoroughly familiar with the contents of it? I am and have read it over very carefully, I assume. Yes. Are all the statements which you made in that letter the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Those things which you state in there, as of your personal knowledge, are true to your personal knowledge? That is right. And those things which you state of necessity on your information and belief, you do believe to be true? That is right. Did you also prepare your Exhibit 1? I believe it is the biographical data. The whole of it? Yes. No, I did not. Who did prepare that, sir? The long biographical account, the third part of it, was prepared by Mrs. Catherine Russell, my secretary. I went over it and pointed out some things that were missing and that I knew were not in order or gith. What is gith? I have no idea. Um or that I knew were not in order or gith, but I did not prepare it. I think I suggested most of the dates in the chronology, but some of them I don't know whether they came from, from counsel, presumably. As to the second, that was also prepared by Mrs. Russell. But you have, I assume, read it over pretty carefully. No. You have not? No, this was meant to be a helpful document containing what we could find in the files. 
Are you or are you not prepared to vouch for the accuracy? No, I am not. It is everything we could find in the files or that I recollected in going over it. You have looked it over, have you not? Sure. Is there anything in there that is not accurate to your knowledge? No. Doctor, I am going to ask you to remember that you are under oath, and that therefore your oath must overweigh your modesty in answering the next few questions I am going to ask you. Will you do that, sir? I will remember that I am under oath. Doctor, is it true that from 1943 until recently, at least, you were the most influential scientist in the atomic energy field in this country? I think this is a question you will have to ask the people influenced. What is your answer? With some people, I was very influential. With others, not at all. I was an influential physicist and put it anywhere you want. You were certainly... I think Lawrence probably had in many ways more influence. Can you think of anyone else that you might say was more influential than you? I should think the commissioners, the physicists who were on the commission, had more effect. Whether they had more influence or not, I don't know. You were certainly one of the most influential, were you not? Of course. You might be described as one of the leading physicists in that field. I have been so described. And you would concede in all modesty that is true. That is an accurate description, is it not? Let me distinguish two things. One is the weight which was attached to my views, and that was considerable. The second is whether I was really very good at the subject, and that I will have to leave to others to testify. Doctor, from 1943 until 45, as director of the Los Alamos Laboratory, you were in direct charge of the atomic weapons program, were you not? Of the program at Los Alamos, and some related things, yes. From 1943 until recently, sir, you had access to all classified information concerning the atomic weapons program, is that true? Yes, probably not some aspects of atomic intelligence, but concerning our own program, yes. And from 1946 until 1952, while you were chairman of the General Advisory Committee, you had access to all classified information concerning the entire atomic energy program, did you not? I did. Doctor, in one way or another, from 1943 until comparatively recently, you participated in all the important decisions respecting the atomic weapons program, did you not? I'm not sure, but I will say yes, to be simple. Substantially all? I won't embroider this. I don't know the deliberations of the interim committee, for instance. You may say I participated because we did give them some expressions of our opinion. That is why I said, doctor, in one way or another. Yes, I think that is probably fair. Is it a fair assessment, or is it a fair statement, doctor, that until recently you know more than anybody else about the atomic weapons program? I should think not. I should think Bradbury, who was in direct charge of it within the nature of things, would have known a lot more about it. Prior to the time when you left Los Alamos in 1945, that was true, was it not? Yes. Subsequent to 1945, Bradbury would probably be the only possible exception, would he not? My feeling is that the people who do the job more than the kibitzers, and therefore some of Bradbury's top assistants, I may mention Froman, Halloway, would have been more intimately versed. They would have certainly known more details and probably had as good a general picture. In all events, Doctor, you knew a great deal about it. Yes. There is no question about that. No, no. While you were chairman of the GAC, were you frequently consulted by Mr. Lilenthal, or on a more or less personal basis for advice? Not frequently, no. Sometimes? Rarely, I think. I remember one occasion. I think the relations were committee to committee. I don't mean that we didn't discuss things, but I don't believe he put to me a problem like shall we do this or what shall we do about such and such a laboratory as an individual. He occasionally talked to me about what to say in speeches. Did he used to call you on the telephone rather frequently? I would say no, if you mean by rather frequently several times a month. I remember occasional telephone calls. 
Doctor, in your opinion, is association with the communist movement compatible with a job on secret on a secret war project? Are we talking of the present, the past? Let us talk about the present, and then we will go to the past. Obviously not. Has that always been your posi- your has that always been your opinion? No, I was associated with the communist movement, as I have spelled out in my letter, and I did not regard it an inappropriate as inappropriate to take the job at Los Alamos. When did that become your opinion? As the nature of the enemy and the nature of the conflict and the nature of the party all became clearer, I would say after the war and probably by 1947. Was it your opinion in 1943? No. You are sure about that? That association with the communist movement, the current association? Yes. I always thought current association. You always thought that. That is right. There had never been any question in your mind that a man who is closely associated with the communist movement or is a member of the communist party has no business on a secret war project. Is that right? That is right. Why did you have that opinion? What was your reason for it? It just made sense to me. Why not? That a man who is working on secret things should have any kind of loyalty to another outfit. Why did you think that the two loyalties were inconsistent? They might be. Why? Because the Communist Party had its own affairs and its own program, which obviously I now know were inconsistent with the best interests of the U.S., but which could at any time have diverged from those of the U.S. You would not think that loyalty to a church would be inconsistent with work on a secret war project, would you? No. And of course, that was not your view in 1943, was it? No. Doctor, what I'm trying to get at is, what specifically was your reason for thinking that membership or close association with the Communist Party and the loyalties necessarily involved were inconsistent with work on a secret war project? The connection of the Communist Party with a foreign power. To wit, Russia. Sure. Would you say that connection with a foreign power, to wit, England, would necessarily be inconsistent? Commitment would be. No, I said connection. Not necessarily. You could be a member of the English-speaking union. What I'm getting at, Doctor, is what particular feature of the Communist Party did you feel was inconsistent with work on a secret war project? After the Chevalier incident, I could not be unaware of the danger of espionage. After the conversations with the Manhattan District security officers, I could not be but acutely aware of it. But you have told me, Doctor, that you always felt that membership or close association in the Communist Party was inconsistent with work on a secret war project. What I am asking you, sir, is why you felt that. Surely you had a reason for feeling that, didn't you? I am not sure. I think it was an obviously correct judgment. Yes, sir. But what I am asking you is to explain to me why it was obvious to you. Because to some extent, an extent which I did not fully realize, the Communist Party was connected with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was a potentially hostile power. It was at that time an ally, and because I had been told that when you were a member of the party, you assumed some fairly solemn oath or obligation to do what the party told you. Espionage, if necessary, isn't that right? I was never told that. Who told you, doctor? My wife. When? I don't remember. Prior to 1943? Oh, yes. Doctor, let me ask you a blunt question. Don't you know, and didn't you know, certainly by 1943, that the Communist Party was an instrument or a vehicle of espionage in this country? I was not clear about it. Didn't you suspect that? No. Wasn't that the reason why you felt that membership in the party was inconsistent with the work on a secret war project? I think I have stated the reason about right. I am asking you now if your fear of espionage wasn't one of the reasons why you felt that association with the Communist Party was inconsistent with work on a secret war project. Yes. Your answer is that it was? Is that it was? Yes. What about former members of the party? Do you think that where a man has formerly been a member of the party, he is an 
appropriate person to work on a secret war project? Are we talking about now or then? Let us ask you now, and then we will go back to then. I think that depends on the character and the totality of the disengagement and what kind of a man he is, whether he is an honest man. Was that your view in 1941, 42, and 43? Essentially. What test do you apply and did you apply in 1941, 42, and 43 to satisfy yourself that a former member of the party is no longer dangerous? As I said, I know very little about who was a former member of the party. In my wife's case, it was completely clear that she was no longer dangerous. In my brother's case, I had confidence in his decency and straightforwardness and in his loyalty to me. Let us take your brother as an example. Tell us the test that you applied to acquire the confidence that you have spoken of. In the case of a brother, you don't make tests, at least. I didn't. Well, I knew my brother. When did you decide that your brother was no longer a member of the party and no longer dangerous? I never regarded my brother as dangerous. I never regarded him. But the fact that a member of the Communist Party might commit espionage did not mean to me that every member of the Communist Party would commit espionage. I see. In other words, you felt that your brother was an exception to the doctrine which you have just announced. No, I felt that, though there was a danger of espionage, that this was not a general danger. In other words, you felt, I am talking now about 1943, that members of the Communist Party might work on a secret war project without danger to this country. Is that right? Yes. What I have said was that there was danger that a member of the Communist Party would not be a good security risk. This does not mean that every member would be but that it would be a good policy to make that rule. Do you still feel that way? Today I feel it is absolute. You feel that no member of the Communist Party should work on a secret war project in this country, without exception? With no exception. When did you reach that conclusion? I would think the same timing that I spoke of before as the obvious war between Russia and the U.S. began to shape up. Could you give us the dates on that? Sure. I would have thought that it was completely clear to me by 1948, maybe 47. 46? I am not sure. Doctor, let me return a bit to the test that you might apply to determine whether a member of the Communist Party in 1943 was dangerous. What test would you apply or would you have applied in 1943? Only the knowledge of the man and his character. Just what you yourself knew about him? I didn't regard myself as the man to settle these questions. I am stating opinions. That is what I am getting at. You have testified that your brother, to your knowledge, became a member of the Communist Party about 1936, is that right? Yes, 1937. Uh, I don't know. When is it your testimony that your brother left the party? His testimony, which I believe, is that he left the party in the spring of 1941. When did you first hear that he left the party? I think in the autumn of 1941. In the autumn? Yes. Is that when he went to Berkeley to work in the radiation laboratory? Yes, on unclassified work. But he shortly began to work on classified work, is that right? The time interval, I think, was longer. Shortly after that, shortly after Pearl Harbor. I'm not clear about that. It was within a year, certainly, probably about six months. You were satisfied at that time that your brother was not a member of the party anymore? Yes. How did you reach that conclusion? He told me. That was enough for you? Sure. Did you know that your brother at that time, and for quite a while after that, denied both publicly and officially that he had ever been a member of the Communist Party? I remember one such denial in 1947. Did you know that your brother's personnel security questionnaire, which he executed when he went to work at Berkeley, failed to disclose his membership in the Communist Party? No, I knew nothing about that. Did you ask him about that? No. You knew, didn't you, sir, that it was a matter of great interest and importance to the security officers to determine whether or not anyone working on the project had been a member of the Communist Party. I found that out some, somewhat later. Didn't you know it at the time? At, it would have made sense. In 1941, it would have made sense. 
Yes. Did you tell anybody, any security officer or anybody else, that your brother had been a member of the Communist Party? Did you tell them that in 1941? I told Lawrence that my brother, I don't know the terms I used, but I certainly indicated that his trouble at Stanford came from his red connections. Doctor, I didn't ask you quite that question. Did you tell Lawrence or anybody else that your brother, Frank, had actually been a member of the Communist Party? I doubt it. Why not? I thought this was the I thought this was the sort of thing that would be found out by normal security check. You were not helping the security check, were you, sir? I would had I would have if I had been asked. Otherwise not. I didn't volunteer this information. You think your brother today would be a good security risk? I rather think so. Beg pardon? I think so. Doctor, will you agree with me that when a man has been a member of the Communist Party, the mere fact that he says that he is no longer a member, and that he apparently has no present interest or connections in the party, does not show that he is no longer dangerous or a security risk? I agree with that. Beg pardon? I agree with that. You agree with that? I would add the fact that he was in the party in 1942 or 1938. Ah, okay, so I would add the fact that I would add, okay, I have to put emphasis correctly because there's not punctuation, not a lot of it. Okay, I would add the fact that he was in the party in 1942 or 38 did not prove that he was dangerous. It merely created a presumption of danger. This is my view, and I am not advocating it. In other words, what you are saying is that a man's denial that he is a member and his apparent lack of interest or connections is not conclusive by any means, is it? No. Did you feel that way in 1943? I would think so. Or 1942? I would think so. I need to state that I didn't think very much about the questions you are putting and very little in the terms in which you are putting them. Therefore, my attempt to tell you what I thought is an attempt at reconstruction. Yes, but you couldn't conceive that you would have you would have had a different opinion in 1943 on a question such as that, would you, doctor? No. Have you ever been told, doctor, that it was the policy of the Communist Party, certainly as early as 1943, or say certainly as early as 1941, that when a man entered confidential war work, he was not supposed to remain a member of the party? No. No one has ever told you that? No. Can you be sure about that, sir? Does that statement come as a surprise to you? I never heard any statement about the policy of the party. Doctor, I notice in your answer on page 5 you use the expression fellow travelers. What is your definition of a fellow traveler, sir? It is a, it is a repugnant word which I used about myself once in an interview with the FBI. I understood it to mean someone who accepted part of the public program of the Communist Party, who was willing to work with and associate with communists, but who was not a member of the party. Do you think, though, a fellow traveler would should be employed on a secret war project? Today? Yes, sir. No. Did you feel that way in 1942 and 43? My feeling, then, and my feeling about most of these things is that the judgment is an integral judgment of what kind of a man you are working with. Today, I think association with the Communist Party, or fellow traveling with the Communist Party, manifestly means sympathy for the enemy. In the period of the war, I would have thought that it was a question of what the man was like, that he would, what he would and wouldn't do. Certainly, fellow traveling and party membership raised a question and a serious question. Were you ever a fellow traveler? I was a fellow traveler. When? From late 1936 or early 1937, and then it tapered off, and I would say I traveled much less fellow after 1939 and very much less after 1942. How long after 1942 did you continue as a fellow traveler? After 1942, I would say not at all. But you did continue as a fellow traveler until 1942. Well, now let us be careful. I want you to be, doctor. 
I had no sympathy with the communist line about the war between the spring of 1940 and when they changed. I did not admire the fashion of their change. Did you cease to be a fellow traveler at the time of the Nazi-Russian Pact of 1939? I think I did, yes. Now, are you changing? Though there were some things that the communists were doing which I still had an interest in. Are you now amending your previous answer that you were more or less a fellow traveler until 1942? Yes, I think I am. Mr. Chairman, I think he testified that he tapered off, did he not? I said more or less as a fellow traveler. I was trying to paraphrase. Because, yeah, that could have been like him perjur perjuring himself right there, you know what I mean? But, oh man, dude, I would not like to be cross-examined by this guy. Oh my god. This is this is definitely intense. Um, I mean, it shows. This guy became a DC Circuit judge, right? So it's like, you know, getting up to that. That's like, you know, probably the, that's like the second highest position you can have as a lawyer, right? So you got to be a very good lawyer to get to that point. Um, obviously, he wasn't a federal judge, you know, during this hearing, but you know. Uh, I think the intenseness and the sort of precision that he like is attacking with uh kind of shows how uh how he might have won that position um unless this is just normal for lawyers maybe uh garrison in the cross-examination will be similarly ferocious but i don't know um anyway Okay. Actually, I'm going to water. Okay. I will say one thing. The good news is that it seems that the Wi-Fi up here is working quite well, which I am very pleased about because uh, it really wasn't working downstairs. Now, I don't like you know, the publicity of this room. Um, so I'll have to, I'll have to figure it out, figure out what I'm going to do next time. But yeah, anyway, um, sorry, I'm going to get back to it. Okay. Do you want to say something more, doctor? Yes. Doctor, I don't intend to cut you off at any time. If I ask a question, and if you have not completed your answer, I wish you would stop me and finish your answer. Let me give you a couple of examples. Yes, sir. The communists took an interest in organizing the valley workers. I think this was long after the Nazi-Soviet pact. That seemed fine to me at the time. They took an interest in extricating and replanting the refugee loyalists, fighters, from Spain. That seemed fine to me at the time. I am not defending the wisdom of these views. I think they were idiotic. In this sense, I approved of some communist objectives. Beating the drums about keeping out of war, especially after the Battle of France, did not seem fine to me. You continued your contributions to communist causes through communist channels until approximately 1942. I don't remember the date. I have no reason to challenge the date in the commission's letter. When did you fill out and file your first personnel security questionnaire? It was in June or July, I guess, of 1942. That was about the time when you ceased to be a fellow traveler. No. How much before that? I have tried to tell you that this was a gradual and not a sharp affair. Any attempt by me to make it, a sharp, to make it sharp would be wrong. I tried in my answer to spell out some of the steps in my understanding. First, of what it was like in Russia. Second, the apparent pliability of American communist positions to Russian interests, and my final boredom with the thing. It was not something that I can put a date on. I did not write a letter to the papers. Is it possible, doctor, for you to set a date when you were sure you were no longer a fellow traveler? When you were sure you were no longer fellow traveling? In that I had no sympathy for any cause of the communists. Sorry. 
in the sense I had no sympathy for any cause the communists promoted? Yes, sir. I think I can put it this way. After the war, and about the time of this letter, which letter? My letter to the ICC ASP. I was clear that I would not collaborate with communists, no matter how much I sympathized with what they pretend to be pretended to be after. This was absolute. I believe I have not done so since. So that would be the ultimate... What? Oh, okay, wait, sorry. I think this might be a Latin legal word kind of thing. Okay. So that would be the ultima thule of your fellow traveling, that date? Yes, but I think to call me a fellow traveler in 1944 or 1946 would be to distort the meaning of the word as I explained it. I think you have explained it pretty well. That is right. Doctor, as a result of your experiences and your knowledge of communists and communism derived from your brother or wherever, were you able in 1942 and 43 to recognize the communist attitude and the communist philosophy, philosophy as Ammon? As, as a man. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Were you able to recognize the communist attitude and the communist philosophy in a man? Uh, in some cases, sure. Would you explain that a little bit? My brother never talked communist philosophy to me. I don't think it meant anything to him. I don't know. Some people did. They were interested in dialectical materialism and believed in the more or less determinate course of history and in the importance of the class war. I would have recognized that. You know, of course, in 1943 and the years prior to that, that communists stood for certain doctrines and certain philosophies and took certain positions, did you not? I don't know how much this is what I knew then, but it seems clear to me that there was that there were tactical positions on current issues, which might be very sensible looking all, might be sent ah okay, I don't know why uh, I can't read also I'm very happy that my uh, laptop battery is holding up longer than I expected it would uh I'm still at fifty eight percent um OBS used to suck, like, all the power for my computer. Anyway, okay. I'll just start the paragraph over. Okay. I don't know how much this is what I knew then, but it seems clear to me that there were tactical positions on current issues, which might be very sensible looking or popular, or might coincide with the views of a lot of people who were not communists. There was also the conviction as to the nature of history, the role of the classes and the changing society, the nature of the Soviet Union, which I would assume was the core of communist doctrine, and I am not quite clear which of these you are talking about. So that's just interesting um, that he mentions tactical positions that he thinks that uh, communists are only holding, like, for convenience. Um, and that would definitely make sense just based on how American communists reacted to the Nazi-Soviet pact, uh, which was to just sort of, like, stop criticizing Nazi Germany for like a few years, which is pretty crazy since, you know, uh, the Nazis were fascists and the communists claimed to oppose fascism as like a very, you know, strict, you know, firm conviction. But it seemed that they were willing to set that aside for the sake of political convenience. And I, th I think that's sort of in line with the uh, sort of philosophical consequentialism and utilitarianism that uh, communists tend to believe in, which is just that, like, there, you know, the goodness or badness of an action is not determined by the action itself, but by the consequences of the action. And so, if a, if criticizing Nazi Germany hurts the communist cause by hurting Soviet Russia then that's a bad thing to do, which is pretty crazy. Um, now, the opposite of that would be 
the deontological view, which is to say the goodness or badness of an action is inherent in the action. Something like thou shalt not kill, right? Uh, very clearly that it doesn't matter why you're doing it. You shouldn't kill people, uh, which I think most people can contrive a situation. <laughs> no, this sounds bad, but I think most people could contrive a situation where they would say it's justifiable to kill and where probably like almost everyone would agree that it's justifiable to kill. Like say that you're like, you know, I mean, this is a bad example. This is Batman. Uh, but say that you're in, say that you're Batman, right? And the only way to stop some, you know, crazy supervillain from nuking a city and killing millions of people would be to kill the villain. If you had the opportunity, most people would take the opportunity to kill that villain, right? So that would be a consequentialist uh, decision. If you believe in more deontological ethics, uh, that would be consequentialist. But frankly, at the end of the day, um, I'm tempted to say no one, but perhaps that would be too much. But uh, let's just say, I don't think anyone is a pure deontologist or a pure consequentialist because you can contrive situations where people wouldn't act in that way. Um, most people fall somewhere in the middle. And I think that's probably right. You know, you don't want to be a cold, callous utilitarian uh, where, you know, if like, you know, five people walk into a hospital needing organ donations, that you're going to harvest them from some healthy person, right? That's, you know, cold consequentialism versus, you know, at the same time, you don't want to be such a like foolhardy, naive optimist that you're going to say, no, I can never do anything. Like I can't tell a lie even. Um, that's sort of, well, anyway, I think I'm delving too much into philosophy, but I love philosophy. I, I think it's a very interesting subject. And that's just one of the sort of philosophical divides that you see in the world, uh, deontology versus conse consequentialism. I think a few years ago we did a, uh, Gravity Max live stream episode on that. So if you uh, want to hear me talk more about that, you can go check that out. Anyway, continuing with the transcript. Okay. What I am getting at, doctor, and I will put it very plainly, do you think in 1942 and 43 you were able to tell a communist when you saw one? Sometimes. What time do you think you would not have been able to? In the case of a man who did not talk like one. What I am getting at is how could you tell when a man was talking like one? What would a man who was talking like a communist say? In 1942 and 43, I should think that an excessive pride and interest and commitment in the Soviet Union, a misstatement of their role, a view that they had always been right in everything they had done, these would have been some of the earmarks. Can you give us an example of such a man that you knew in those years? I remember Isaac Folkoff talking about the wisdom of the Nazi-Soviet pact, the strength of the Red Army, the certainty of Soviet victory, at a time when I was very skeptical of the possibility of Soviet victory. And those were indi indicative to you that Folkoff was a communist, is that right? I knew it also, but they would have been. When was that, doctor? Obviously, after the war started in Russia, probably in the winter of 1941 and 42. Do you recall where you heard him make those statements? I think it was at Berkeley. Where in Berkeley? I don't remember. Not a public meeting. At someone's house. Yes. Your house. Conceivably. He was at your house? I think so. My wife is sure not. I don't know. It would not have been unusual for him to be there, would it? I don't believe he came more than once if he came at all. It would have been unusual. Uh, then Mr. Gray, excuse me, I would like to get that last. Did you say it would have been unusual? Yes. It would have been unusual. Yes. Guys, I'm thinking it would have been unusual. 
I don't know, crazy. Uh, anyway, um, is there some particular occasion that you had in mind when he was at your home? I remember this conversation I just repeated to you. Wasn't that, uh, wasn't that at your house? I think so, I'm not sure. You think so? Yes. What was the occasion that he was at your house, to the best of your recollection? I have no recollection of what brought him. He had a son, I believe, living at Berkeley. Were there other people present? Oh, surely, but I don't know who. There was no meeting of any kind, no conference, no conclave. Can you think of any other person that you recall now, during those years of 1942 and 43, maybe 44, that talked and acted like a communist so that you knew him to be one? Obviously, I knew Steve Nelson was, and I think he talked about the Red Army sometimes. This wasn't a time at which communists would at which communist talk was very easily recognizable. Would you search your memory for any other example you might give us? Possibly, though I don't think he was a member of the party, Bernard Peters would have talked along those lines. Did Peters ever tell you that he had been a member of the party at one time in Germany? That was my impression, but he told me that I had misunderstood him. This was before the Nazis. Yes. Anybody else that you can think of that you can identify as a communist by his talk and actions? In a quite different way, and not indicating communist connections, Hawkins, that is David Hawkins, talked about philosophy in a way that indicated an interest and understanding and limited approval, anyway, of Engels, and so on. Of who? Engels, who was a communist doctrinaire, whom I have not read. Was that before Hawkins came to Los Alamos? I don't remember when it was, but we have had several discussions. It was either before he came to Los Alamos or while he was at Los Alamos. Yes. Anybody else that talked like a communist? Somebody that you were able to identify by these tests that you have given us, these objective in indicators of communist sympathy or communist connections. Nothing is coming to my mind. If you have a specific person in mind, why don't you suggest it? Let us pass to something else. Mr. Chairman, it seems to be 11 o'clock. If it meets with the board approval, we might take a brief recess. I think it would be well. I think it would be very wise. Okay, brief recess. Oh, wow. Okay. Ah. Roger Rob, dude. He is crazy. Oh, my God. I, it's crazy. Like, he is... He's, he's intense. I mean... They tried to portray some of that intensity in the movie, but I like the raw transcripts. I feel like almost portrays it like better. Like you can really see, just like he's just drilling into him over and over, trying to get him to contradict himself. You know, like that's pretty crazy to me that he's like trying to get Oppenheimer to perjure himself. So he's like not just looking for the truth, you know, as you should, like pursuing the truth. He's also just trying to get him on perjury for something, which is pretty crazy. Anyway. The proceeding will resume. Doctor, do you think that social contacts between persons, between a person employed in secret war work and communists or communist adherence is dangerous? Are we talking about today? Yes. Certainly not necessarily so. They could conceivably be. Was that your view in 1943 and during the war years? Yes, I think it would have been. My awareness of the danger would be greater today. But is it fair to say that during the war years you felt that social contacts between a person employed in secret war work and communists or communist adherents were potentially dangerous, is that correct? Were conceivably dangerous. 
I visited Jean Tatlock in the spring of 1943. I almost had to. She was not much of a communist, but she was certainly a member of the party. There was nothing dangerous about that. There was nothing potentially dangerous about that. But you would have felt then, I assume, that a rather continued or constant association between a person employed on the atomic bomb project and communists or communist adherents was dangerous. Potentially dangerous. Conceivably dangerous. Look, I have had a lot of secrets in my head a long time. It does not matter who I associate with. I don't talk about those secrets. Only a very skillful guy might pick up a trace of information as to where I had been or what I was up to. Passing the time of day with a communist, I don't think it is wise, but I don't see that it is necessarily dangerous if the man is discreet and knows what he is up to. Why do you think that social contacts during the war years between persons on the project, by the project I mean the atomic bomb project, and communists or communist adherents involved a possibility of danger? We were really fantastic in what we were trying to keep secret there. The people who were there, the life, all of us, were supposed to be secret. Even a normal account of a man's friends was something that we didn't want to get out. I saw the Fermis last night. That was not the kind of thing to say. This was a rather unusual kind of blanket of secrecy. Oh, sorry. He's still talking. Um, this was a rather unusual kind of blanket of secrecy. I don't think if a communist knows that I am going to Washington to visit the AEC that is going to give him any information, but it was desired that there be no knowledge of who was at Los Alamos, or at least no massive knowledge of it. Did you have any talk with your brother, Frank, about his social contacts at the time he came on the project? When he came to work for Ernest Lawrence, before there was any classified work, before I knew about it, and before he was involved in it, I warned him that Ernest would fire him if he was not a good boy. That is about all I remember. You didn't discuss this with him. You didn't discuss with him his social contacts. No. Either at that time or subsequently. If you mean, did he ever tell me that he had seen so-and-so, I don't know. No. I don't believe we had a systematic discussion. Did you ever urge him to give up any social contacts who might have been communists or communist adherents? I don't know the answer to that. It doesn't ring a bell. If you did, it made no impression on you. Not enough to last these years. Doctor. Referring to your answer. By the way, do you have a copy of your answer? I have a copy of it. I think it would be well if you kept that before you, because I might refer to it from time to time. At pages 20 and 21, you speak of, a, of the statement in the letter of to General Nichols that you secured the employment of doubtful persons on the project, and you mentioned Lominitz, Friedman, and Weinberg, you say on page 21, when Lominitz was introduced into the army, you wrote me asking me to help his return to the project. I forwarded a copy of his letter to the Manhattan District Security Officers and let that matter rest there. I will show you the original of the letter signed by you dated October 19, 1943, and closing a copy of a letter apparently signed by Lominitz of October 15, 1943, and I will ask you, Mr. Rob, do you have a copy? Yes, we have those. I will ask you if your letter is the one that you spoke of in your answer. Yes. And the enclosure was the one you had received from Lominitz. I have not looked at the enclosure, but I have no reason to doubt it, yes. Your original letter is on the stationery of P.O. Box 1663, Santa Fe, New Mexico. That was the Los Alamos address, was it not? That was the only address we had. The letter is dated October 19, 1943, and reads as follows. Okay, so John Lansdale. Dear Colonel Lansdale, I am enclosing a copy of a letter which I just received from Rossi Lominitz. You will note that he states that Dr. Lawrence is interested in having him return to the project for work, and suggests that I make a similar request. Since I am not in 
possession of the facts which led to Mr. Lominitz's induction, I am, of course, not able to endorse this request in an absolute way. I can, however, say that Mr. Lominitz's competence and his past experience on the work in Berkeley should make him a man of real value, whose technical service we should make every effort to secure for the project. In particular, Lominitz has been working on a part of Dr. Lawrence's project, in which historically I have a close interest, and which I know is in need of added personnel. Sincerely yours, Oppenheimer. This is Lominitz's letter. Presidio of Monterey. Dear Oppie, for, for four days now, I've been a private in the army, and to date it's not half bad. We have taken examinations and had interviews in order to determine where we might best be assigned and are waiting for the assignment orders to come through from 9th Corps area headquarters in Fort Douglas, Fort Douglas, Utah. Before I left Berkeley, I spoke to Lawrence, and it was his idea for himself to put in a request that I be assigned back to work with him. He thought it might be quite effective if, at the same time, you were to ask for me, either to work with Lawrence or elsewhere. I do not know whether or not you are in sympathy with these with this idea. It appeals to me, however, and if you are interested, it might be wise to put it in a request before assignment has been made by 9th Corps Area Headquarters, which will certainly occur within a few days. In any case, so far I'm rather enjoying the life here. Monterey is a beautiful place. Although they work us hard, they do it efficiently and with a purpose. The barracks, the men's hall, the grounds are kept scrupulously clean. The food is excellent and abundant. There is a small library, a theater, and beer at the PX, and the men are easy to get along with. I have not heard from Max since he got to Salt Lake City. I certainly hope he is getting along all right. If I am shipped to another camp for basic training, I'll let you hear from me there. Respectfully yours, Private Lominitz. So I think this actually makes it into the movie, too, is that Lawrence's assistant, Lominitz, uh, gets drafted, and then uh, they have to, like, reverse that decision. I forget, I mean, I guess he was a communist. I forget if that was the, I, I think it was the reason they drafted him. I forget exactly, but yeah, um, that's in the movie. Okay, so... Dr. Mr. Rob. Doctor, referring to your letter, you state, I am, of course, not able to endorse this request in an absolute way. What do you mean by that, sir? The meaning to me, reading it now, is that I didn't know what the security problems were with Lominitz. I had just been given a vague account that there were some. The phrase was that he had been indiscreet. I therefore could not judge whether there was a security hazard in his working on the project. If there was not, it seemed like a good idea. I see. The thing that he was working on had been had been robbed of personnel because they came to Los Alamos. One of the men at Los Alamos was under great pressure to return to Berkeley, and we needed him at Los Alamos. This is what this recalls to me. Is this a fair statement? This meant that, so far as you knew, he was all right, but there was something else about him that you didn't know. No. What it meant was that, as far as the technical side of things went, it would be a good idea to have him back. I would leave it to the security officer to decide whether there were overriding considerations. Did you know anything about him at that time that led you to believe, except, as you have said, vague stuff, that he was a security risk? It was very vague. I knew one thing, and I reported it. That is, that this whole business about Lominitz had caused a big flap, his being inducted. I think more than one person wrote to me about it. Lansdale didn't tell... Lansdale didn't tell me more than that he had been quite indiscreet. In Berkeley, I talked with the security officer, and... Either he suggested, or he concurred in the suggestion, that I talk with Lominitz and see if I could not get him to come in and talk frankly about what the trouble was. 
He said there wasn't anything. There was nothing to talk about. This didn't reassure me. Of course, you would not have written the letter if you had known Lominitz was a communist, would you? An active communist? Yes. No. Would you if you had known that he had previously been a communist? That would have depended on lots of things. What kind of a man he was, how long ago it was. In all events, you didn't know then, did you? No. Would you have written that letter if you had known that Lominitz had actually disclosed information about the project to some unauthorized person? Of course not. All you knew was that Lansdale had said that in some way or another, this Lominitz had been indiscreet. I knew that he was a relative of someone in Oklahoma, I think, who had been involved in a famous sedition case of some kind. As I said in my answer, I knew that he had been reluctant to take any part in the war work, but certainly would not have wanted to have but certainly would not have wanted to have his around or suggested that he be around if you had known that he was a communist or if you had known that he had revealed or disclosed information to some unauthorized person. That is right. Beg pardon? That is right. Your answer at page 21. Your answer at page 21, you say that in 1943, when I was alleged to have stated that I knew several individuals then at Los Alamos who had been members of the Communist Party, I knew of only one, she was my wife, and so forth. Are you, are you sure that you know only one person at Los Alamos that at that time who had been a member of the Communist Party? I would not have written it if I had not been if it had not been by my best recollection. I thought so. How about Charlotte Serber? I don't believe she ever was a member of the Communist Party. Was she at that time at Los Alamos? Yes, and in a responsible position. You did not know? No, I don't know today. In fact, I don't today believe. Pardon? I don't today believe unless there is evidence that I have never heard of. It would be a great surprise to you to find that she had ever been a member of the party. It would. Now, speaking of surprise, your answer at page 21, you state, I asked for the transfer of David Bohm to Los Alamos, but this request, like all others, was subject to the assumption that the usual security requirements would apply. When I was told that there was objection on security grounds to the transfer, I was much surprised, but of course agreed. By that, do you mean that when you asked for the transfer of Bohm to Los Alamos, so far as you knew, there was nothing wrong with him? Absolutely. Otherwise, you would not have asked, is that right? I asked for the transfer of my brother, or at least concurred in it later, and there had been something wrong with him. But if I had known if there was anything wrong, I would certainly... I believe it was a Colonel De Silva that told you that, was it not? No. About Bohm? No, it was a coded telephone message from General Groves. When I asked what was wrong, I was told that he had relatives in Nazi Germany. So he might be subject to pressure from the Nazis. I won't pretend that I fully believed this story. I didn't know what to think. That was the only thing that indicated that Bohm was not a fit man to come to Los Alamos. What happened, this was a fairly dramatic thing and unique, so I remember it. I was in Santa Fe. General Groves and I had a little quadratic, quadratic letter code. He called me up and told me in the code that Bohm could not come. That was that. I asked maybe a couple of people later what was wrong, and they told me this story. About Nazi Germany. Yes. Would De Silva be one of those people? I don't remember. He was your security man there, was he not? Yes, I don't remember when he came. There was a first security man. Did you ever talk to De Silva about Bohm? I remember talking about Weinberg, Peters. Bohm may have been one of them. I think only in terms 
I think only in terms of a very general question on De Silva's part, which of these is the most dangerous man in your opinion? Can you fix the approximate time when you got that information from General Groves about Bohm? You mean that Bohm could not come? Yes. That would have been in late March of 1943. That is right. Was there a man named Bernard Peters at the Berkeley Radiation Laboratory in 1943? Yes. Did you know him? Yes. How well did you know him? Really fairly well. Had you come to know him? How had you come to know him? He was a graduate student in physics and was interested in theoretical physics, so he was a student of mine. I knew both him and his wife personally. Was your, was your relationship with Peters more than just the normal relationship of a professor and a student? Yes. Social as well? Yes. Was he a guest at your home from time to time? Yes, he was. And his wife as well? Yes. And were you and your wife guests at their house? I am sure we were. How frequently did you see Peters outside of the normal contact that you had with him as a professor? I am talking now about the years 1942 and 43, and so on. I think after early 1943, not frequently, because you were down at Los Alamos. No, even before that. After it was clear that Peters was not going to Los Alamos, I had raised with him the question of whether he would. Raised with Peters? Yes, of whether he would come. The fact that he was the right kind of physicist and that she was a doctor and we were short of doctors made this an attractive deal. They decided not to come. I think in 1941 we saw quite a lot of them. When did you first meet Peters? I don't remember the date. It would have been in the late 30s, either at the time or shortly before, the time that he came to study in the graduate school. When did he come to study there? I can do a little dead reckoning. Approximately. Approximately 1938 or something like that. I believe you said that you suggested to Peters he would be a good man to come down to Los Alamos. I did. And Mrs. Peters, being a doctor, you thought she could be a help down there too. I certainly did. When was that, doctor? It would have been late 1942. Late 1942. That is right. Mrs. Peters, you say, was a doctor. Did she ever act as your physician? Yes, she did. I think only once in the spring of 1941. It may have been more frequent. I remember that time. But your relations with her were both professional and social, I take it. Oh, yes. As of 1943 or 42, what did you know about the background of Dr. Peters? I knew that he had been caught as a student. His father was a professional man of some kind whom I met they lived in Berkeley. That he had been caught, I believe, in Munich at the time of Hitler's rise to power. That he had taken part in that struggle. I would then have said, I have subsequently said, as a communist. He has told me that this is an exaggeration. He was put in Dachau that he managed to get out that his wife and he escaped the country, that they came to this country, that they made some sort of a deal or agreement that he would work and she would go to medical school, and then she would work and he would go to college or to the university. These are in broad outlines, the background. Did you regard Peters as in any way a dangerous man to be on a secret war project? I am alleged to have said so. Did you say so? I think I did. When? At Los Alamos. When? I think it was 1943. 1943. But I am not sure. I think not that he was a dangerous man to have on a secret war project, no. I think what I was asked by De Silva, here are four names, Bohm, Weinberg, and somebody else, and Peters, which of these would you regard as the most likely to be dangerous? And I think I answered Peters. Was that after you had suggested to Peters that he come to Los Alamos? It was. How long after? A year and a quarter, something like that. What had you 
when had he formed that view that Peters might be a dangerous man? During the period that he decided not to come to Los Alamos. What caused you to form that opinion? The way he talked about things. Did, had he ever told you that he was a member of the Communist Party in Germany? I believe that he had, or that I had been told it by a friend. I believed that he had. He told me later that I had misunderstood him. When did you believe that he told you that? Early. When? Late 30s. Who was the friend that you thought might have told you? Possibly Jean Tatlock. Did she know Peters too? Yes. Quite well. She knew Hannah Peters quite well. Did you know anything about Mrs. Peters' background? Much less. What did you know about her? That she also escaped from Germany, that she went to Italy, that she had been in medical school in this country. What did you know about her association with the Communist Party? Literally nothing. Wasn't it pretty well known that Peters had been a communist, and when I say wasn't it, I mean in 1941, 42, and 43? I'm not sure. What is your best judgment? I would say it was not well known. You would say it was not, but I'm not sure. Did anyone else besides Miss Tatlock tell you anything about Peter's communist connections? No. The way in which this story came to me was that he had been involved in the great battle between the communists and the Nazis in Germany. Not that he was a member of the communist party in this country or anything like that. I think it came from him, and I don't think it came from Miss Tatlock, but I am not sure. Doctor, you have told us that... To the best of your recollection, Peters told you, maybe in 1938, that he had been a member of the Communist Party. You testified, I think you said in 1942 or 43, you suggested to him that he come to Los Alamos, is that correct? That's right. What test did you apply at the time you suggested that he come to Los Alamos to satisfy yourself that he had severed any connection with the Communist Party? I didn't think... And I don't think he had a connection with the Communist Party for five, six, seven, or eight years since he left Germany. That was a different Communist Party. What I am asking you, sir, is how did you reach that conclusion? What test did you apply? He spoke disparagingly of the party. When was that? From time to time, all during this period, he never indicated any connection with it, though we often saw each other. I was just sure that he had no connection with the Communist Party. Did there come a time when you changed that opinion? No. Are you satisfied that he never had any connection with the Communist Party? I really know nothing about it after 1942, therefore my satisfaction doesn't mean much except with regard to that time. Ah, some... I gotta, gotta chat. Ah, someone... Uh, JCO... Fortco. JCO Fortco says, I still need to watch the film. Cool idea you have going on here today. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad that you like it. Um, yeah, after I watched the movie, I was very interested in like what went on with the hearings, especially since the transcripts were publicly available online. So I was like, oh, why not uh, read through them and make a little, you know, audiobook with commentary, I guess. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's, that's what I'm doing. Um, yeah. All right. Anyway. Uh, okay. Doctor, this young man, Giovanni Rossi Lominitz, I believe you called him Rossi, didn't you? That is the name he went by. He was a student of yours. Yes. When? Well, I might assist you with that. Why don't you tell me? The record shows that he graduated at Oklahoma with a BA in physics in 1940. Then, I believe, he came to Berkeley and became a student of yours. Is that in accord with your recollection? It could be. He went to work at the radiation laboratory at Berkeley on June 1, 1942. Is that in accord with your memory? I have no recollection. But you would accept that? Sure. 
The record also shows he was born October 10, 1921. Of course, you don't know that, but he was quite a young man. He was extraordinar extraordinarily young, which would make him not quite 21 when he went to work at the laboratory. Yes. Did he take his doctorate under you? No, I don't think he got through with it. He was studying for it when the war interrupted. I am not certain on this point. Did you ask Lominitz to come to work on the project? Not in those terms. What I remember of it, I put down in my answer that I endeavored to persuade him that he ought to be willing to do work on behalf of his country. It might be helpful to the board if we had an answer to a statement made to you in a letter to you from General Nichols at page 5. Which letter is this? Letter of December 23, 1953, page 5. In the case of Giovanni Rossi Lominitz, you urged him to work on the project. Is that true? I don't know. I urged him to work on military problems. The particular problem you had in mind was the atomic bomb, wasn't it? Yes. Oh, shoot. Ah, sorry. That was, that was Rob. He said, the particular problem you had in mind was the atomic bomb, wasn't it? Yes, but there were lots of other military undertakings. I believe that this report stems from my own account. I don't know where else it comes from. If that is true, I go ahead and accept it, but I don't remember at this point. I will continue the reading from the letter of General Nichols. In the case of Giovanni Rossi Lominitz, you urged him to work on the project, although you stated that you knew that he had been very much of a red when he first came to the University of California. Did you so state? I have no recollection of it. I have no reason to doubt it. And that you emphasized to him that he must forgo all political activity if he became if he came onto the project. Did you so emphasize? I doubt that. You doubt it? Yes, because I never knew of any political activity. In August 1943, you protested against the termination of his deferment. Did you do that? Do we have anything on that, Mr. Garrison? Uh, oh, wait. Okay. Don't you have any recollection, one way or another, about assistance from the council? I don't. That is, I don't have any recollection of to whom or in what terms. Did I communicate with Lansdale about that? We have in our file a copy. I assume Dr. Oppenheimer will recall it. To Colonel James C. Marshall, Manhattan District Address Address, dated July 31st, 1943, understand that the deferment of Rossi Lominitz left in charge of my end of work for Lawrence Project by me, requested by Lawrence and Shane, turned down by your office. Believe, understand reasons, but feel that very serious mistake is being made. Lominitz now only man at Berkeley who can take this responsibility. His work for Lawrence preeminently satisfactory, if he is drafted and not returned promptly to project, Lawrence will request that I release one or two of my men. I shall not be able to accede to this. Therefore, I urge you support deferment of Lominitz or ensure by other means his continued availability to project. Have communicated with Fiddler and am sending this to you in support of what I regard as urgent request. Lominitz deferment expires August 2. That's that's pretty funny. I, I, I think this is a telegram. That's going to be my guess for the clipped language, uh, which is kind of funny because that's kind of like texting language too. But um, yeah, anyway. Do you recall that now? It is obviously right. I didn't recall it. You sent that telegram. Sure. And you didn't recall that when I asked you the question whether you protested the deferment of Lominitz? No, I didn't. You had not seen that until your counsel read it. I saw it at the time. I have not been over this file. You have not been over that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, would it be proper for me to say that this was a file given to me by Mr. Marx, who had very much earlier discussed this with Dr. Oppenheimer? I don't know at what point. I have not been over it with Dr. Oppenheimer myself. 
Mr. Chairman, may I inquire what other official papers that Mr. Marx had that he turned over to counsel for Dr. Oppenheimer? Is this an official paper? It certainly is. I believe this is an official paper. I think at least I have a copy of it here. I have the original here. It is stamped confidential. It came from the records of the Manhattan District. I am slightly curious to know what Mr. Marks, a lawyer in private practice, is doing with parts of the files of the Manhattan Engineering District. Can you throw any light on this? I don't know. Could you say whether, by looking at that file there, seem to be documents of classified nature in it? I really don't know. I honest, it honest, it honestly looks, ah, sorry. Um, I honestly looked at this just now. I do think I went over it with great speed over that a minute or two ago. Perhaps the chair should say that this is not a fair inquiry to put you to since Mr. Marx is not available, at least at this point, to an answer to the question. I think the record should reflect that at least there seems to be some reason for concern and inquiry as to how, as counsel said, there seems to be in the possession of a civilian lawyer in the community at least a document which is an official document and which, so far as this record shows, is still marked classified with the classification of confidential. I think it is unfair to expect you to answer that question. I then, however, I should say, I think, however, I should say, for the record, that this board may find it desirable to pursue this point further. Mr. Chairman, I shall make diligent inquiry during the noon hour and tell you all that I can. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I might add, I trust that Mr. Garrison will inquire of Mr. Marks whether or not as general counsel, when he left his employment with the commission as general counsel, he took any other records or papers from the files. I believe that Mr. Marks would have gotten this in a very different way. If I had a file on the subject of laminates, or if there were things around in my file and my secretary assembled them, he would have gotten it that way. I believe this is to be correct. I, I believe this to be correct. Doctor, do you have in your files now any other government records or papers which you have not returned to the commission? I was supposed to return everything. I directed my secretary to return everything, and I doubt very much if I have anything. I know you were supposed to return everything. My question was, sir, did you? I signed a statement saying that I had directed my secretary to return to the commission all classified documents. Doctor, I'm sorry. I don't want to fence with you. Would you please answer my question? Did you return all the government records you had on your possession? From the commission? From the commission or any other source? From the commission. From the commission? You still have government records from other sources? Yes, they are in a vault. I don't have them accessible. Because of my ignorance, I just raised the question whether a copy of this thing was commission or government property. I just don't know. I don't know. I'm just curious to know. <laughs> this is funny, the documents, because um, obviously we're seeing that today with the uh, one of the Trump indictments is the uh, documents thing. So even back then they cared about the documents. Okay. Uh, also, JCO Fortco says, I am enjoying it. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying this live stream, JCO Fortco. Uh, anyway, continuing. Uh, is there, oh wait, is there any indication of a classification on the copy you have? No. I have the original here of that teletype. It is marked confidential. Uh, doctor, would that have been sent in code? I don't know, but everything that went out of Los Alamos was confidential because we were confidential. Is there any question that this telegram was sent over a government wire? None. It was, was it not? Sure. 
You didn't consider that telegram to be a part of your personal records, did you, sir, as distinct from the records of the Manhattan Engineering Project? If I took a copy of it, I did. But you have told us it was sent over a government wire and presumably at government expense on a matter of official business, is that right? That is right. Now, getting back to the question that we started with, it is true that in August 1943, you protested against the termination of the deferment of Lominitz, is that correct? That is right. And it is true that you requested that he be returned to the project after his entry into the military service? That is right. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Robb, in Nichols' letter, this is all in one sentence. It says, in August 1943, you protested the termination of his deferment and requested that he be returned to the project after his entry into the military service. This latter suggested action did not take place in August 1943. I think the record should show. In fact, I don't think there has been any testimony here about the request that he be returned to the project after he entered the military. That was your letter of October 19, 1943, was it not, Doctor? That is right. That is the one I have before me. I beg your pardon. This is the letter that was read into the record. That requested that he, re that requested that he be returned. If there were no security objections. That was dated October 19, 1943. Yes. Doctor. How well did you know Lominitz when he went to work at the radiation lab on June 1, 1942? Not very well. Did you come to know him better thereafter? No, certainly somewhat better because we would see each other from time to time. Did you have any relationship with him other than the relationship of professor and student? Obviously, this talk that I had with him w was somewhat abnormal for the relation of professor and student. Otherwise, not, I should think. Did he call you by your first name? Robert? No. Did he call you Oppie? He did in this letter. Did he do that habitually? I don't know. What did you call him? Rossi, I think. What did you know about his background, his past, at the time he came onto the project on June 1, 1942? I knew, but I no longer recall the connection in Oklahoma. Will you tell us about that? He had an uncle or a relative who was tried on a sedition charge. It was a very major affair and was reported in the press shortly before he came to Berkeley. He was recommended as an extremely brilliant student. Who recommended him? The people at the University of Oklahoma. Do you recall who they were? No. Backgrounds beyond that, backgrounds when he came, nothing. When did... Were you going to finish? Had you finished? This was as to the time when he arrived in Berkeley. No, I am asking you at the time when he went to work on the secret project on June 1, 1942, what you knew about him as of that time. After that, I knew something about his work. I knew he talked in a fairly wild way. What do, what do you mean by that? For instance, the statement that he didn't care, not that he didn't care, but it seemed to him that the war was so terrible that it didn't matter which side won, which I tried to talk him out of. That didn't seem to me a very sensible statement. Anything else? I don't think so. Did you know at the time he came on the project that he had been what you described as a red? That was the story which he arrived with in Berkeley. Other graduate students told me that. Who? I don't remember. Weinberg? No. Bohm? No. You are quite sure it was not Weinberg or Bohm? Positive. But you can't recall who it was. That's right. What was the name of that case in Oklahoma? Do you remember? I think it was Lominitz. Was it the Allen case? I'm sorry, I don't know. You say it was a criminal you say it was a criminal sedition or syndicalism case. 
I have not looked this up. It was hearsay at the time or newspaper stuff. I can't tell you beyond the fact that it was a sedition or syndicalism case of some kind. Did you discuss it with Lominitz? I believe not. Beg pardon? I believe not. You have mentioned several times a conversation you had with Lominitz just prior to the time when he came to work on the secret project at Berkeley. Would you search your recollection and tell us all, tell us all you can tell us about that conversation? I told you that he explained that he wanted to continue to study physics, that he was not eager to participate in the war effort. I argued with him about it. I don't know whether I convinced him at the time. Is that all you recall about it? Yes. Where did that conversation take place? I think it was up in our home on Eagle Hill. When you say our, you mean your home. Yes, I think I asked him to come up to talk to me. I am not certain of that. Did you, in that conversation, discuss his radical political activities? My memory is not. Was there anything said about him going to work in the shipyards? I don't remember it. I think not. Did you know anything about his radical or political activities at that time? No. Did you lay down any conditions to Lominitz which you thought he should abide by in the event he went to work on the secret project at Berkeley? This has a much more sinister sound than anything I could have said. I might have said he should behave himself. What did you mean by that? He should not do anything wild or foolish. Such as what? Such as make speeches. About what? About the injustice of the world, the folly of the war, or any of the things that he shot his, that he shot his face off about. What led you to think that he might? Because I had listened to him talk for a year or so. Where had you heard his talk? This is not public speeches, I mean his conversation. Where had you heard those? In the physics department. You mean in the classrooms? No, in the offices. So, at least to that extent, your relationship with him had not been strictly that of a professor and a student, had it? The relations between me and my student were not that I stood at the head of a class and lectured. I understand that, doctor. Was it customary for your student to talk to you about the injustices of the world and things of that sort? It was, not un it was not uncustomary to talk to each other and me about anything that was on their minds. But you are quite sure that you knew nothing about Lominitz's past radical or political activities at that time. Activities, no. Why do you emphasize activities? Because, though I don't remember well, I do remember talk and not what he said, but the general color of it. Do you remember any political talk? No. You are quite sure that you laid down no conditions for him to abide by in the event that he went to work on the secret project, beyond what I have said. Was there any reason for you to lay down such conditions? I have told you that I knew nothing of political activity. That is what I thought. Now, prior to the time when Lominitz went on the secret project on June 1942, did you discuss with any security officer anything that you knew about Lominitz's background? No, because... Well, no. You didn't tell any security officer that you knew his family had been mixed up in a criminal case in Oklahoma involving sedition? No. You may have answered this, doctor, but how did you hear about that case? I am not clear, either by reading about it, no, somebody in the department told me about it. May I ask, did this decision involve the Communist Party? It was a criminal syndicalism case. I am not clear. It was sedition or criminal syndicalism. Did you understand it involved communist activities? It was not clear to me, but revolutionary activity or alleged revolutionary activity. It might have been communist, is that correct? Yes. As we have seen, there came a time, did there not, when you learned that Lominitz was about to be inducted into the army? That's right. How did you learn that? I first heard it in a letter from Dr. Con Condon. Dr. Who? 
Condon. Condon? Yes. What is his first name? Edward. Edward Condon. That's right. How did he happen to write you about it? He had been at Los Alamos as associate director and left after a relatively short time and he transferred to Berkeley where he was involved in getting a transition from the laboratory work to the construction work under Westinghouse. He was director of research or associate director of research for Westinghouse. He was working in Berkeley. One of the thing, oh wait, sorry. One of the things he was working on was this invention that I mentioned a day or so ago. Why he wrote about, why he wrote me about it, I don't know. He wrote me about it in a great sense of outrage. About when was that? I don't recall. Do you have a copy of that letter? I don't have a copy of that. I don't know. I have not seen it. I doubt it. This would be about when? It would have been at the time the matter came up. That was about July. That's right. Somewhat earlier, I think. A little earlier? I think I went to Berkeley in July. I may have my dates mixed up. You made quite a stir about the matter, didn't you? Apparently I did. You sent the teletype that we have seen. That is right. Whom did you talk to about it? Lansdale, when he was in Los Alamos. That is, Colonel Lansdale. That's right. The security officer of the district. That's right. A security officer whose name I no longer remember in Berkeley. Would that be Captain Johnson? It is not that you can refresh my memory. I really don't know. Would it be Colonel Pash? I remember him. Did you talk to him about it? That I think is possible. Anybody else? I don't think so. During that period of time, when this matter was under discussion and consideration, did you talk to Lominitz about it? With the approval or the suggestion, I don't remember, of the security officer, I endeavored to persuade Lominitz to get the thing straight with the security people. He assured me that there was nothing to get straight. Did you talk to him on the telephone? I don't remember. I thought I talked to him in person. I think you did, but did you also talk to him on the telephone on several occasions? I have no recollection of that, but you apparently know that I did. By the way, did you talk to Dr. Weinberg about Lominitz's induction? At that time? At that time or at any time? I would be virtually certain not. At the time you discussed this matter with Colonel Lansdale, what did he tell you about it? That Lominitz had been indiscreet. Did Lansdale tell you that the what the indiscretion was? No. Did Lansdale tell you or suggest to you that a rather thorough investigation was being made in connection with Lominitz? A thorough investigation? Yes, sir. I don't believe so. Maybe he said we have looked into the matter very completely or something like that. Did you understand either from Lansdale or anybody else that there was an investigation revolving around Lominitz at the time? I understand that there was an investigation, I won't say an investigation, but that something had been found out and that people were worried and they were trying to get it straightened out. Worried about what? The alleged indiscretion. Worried about security? Yes. Security meant espionage, didn't it? Not to me. It didn't? I didn't know what this was all about. But you knew there was some investigation going on, didn't you? Yes. I notice in your answer at page 21, you say that you assumed that Lominitz would be checked by the security officers as a matter of course, is that correct? I say that. Having that assumption in mind, at the time Lominitz joined the secret project, did you tell the security officers anything that you knew about Lominitz's background? I knew very little about his background, and I told them nothing. However much you knew, you told them nothing. That's right. You didn't think that would have been appropriate for you to do? I do today. You do today. 
Yes. Why? I think it would have been appropriate for me to tell the security officers anything I knew, but I didn't at that time volunteer any information. Why do you today think it would have been appropriate? I understand it as the proper relation of an employee to his government. Doctor, what I am asking you is why do you so understand? What is your reasoning? That part of the obligation of a government employee is to make information available. You knew that the security of this project was of vital importance to the U.S., did you not? I did. And you had information, however little you think it was, which had a bearing upon whether or not Lominitz was a good security risk, didn't you? That is right. And you now understand, do you not, that it was your duty to make that information available to the security officers, is that correct? That's right. Especially in view of the fact that you had urged Lominitz to join the project, is that correct? That's right. But you didn't do it. That's right. You have said that Lominitz was not a close friend of yours. That's right. So that your failure to make that information available was not because of any ties of friendship, was it? No. I notice in your telegram, which Mr. Garrison has read to Colonel Marshall, by the way, who was, who was Colonel, uh, okay, sorry. I notice in your telegram, which Mr. Garrison has read to Colonel Marshall, by the way, who was Colonel Marshall? He was, before General Groves took charge, the head of the Manhattan Project. What his position at this moment was, I am not clear. I notice in your telegram, in which you state that this is an urgent request, you say that Lominitz was the only man in Berkeley who could take this responsibility, and so forth. Lominitz, at that time, was 21 years old, wasn't he? 22, I guess, by the record. After he left and went in the army, did the project suffer very seriously? I think it was taken over by Peters, who had been doing something different. Lominitz's job was taken over by Peters? I believe so, but I am not sure. At that time, I was pretty busy with my own troubles. Did you suggest Peters as a possibility for that job? No. What I am getting at is the project did not collapse after Lominitz left, did it? No, the things were put into the Oak Ridge plants. I don't know what arrangements were made. Yes, sir. Doctor, on page 22 of your letter of March 4, 1954, you speak of what, for convenience, I will call the Eltonton Chevalier incident. That's right. You describe the occasion when Chevalier spoke to you about this matter. Would you please, sir, tell the board, as accurately as you can and in as much detail as you can, exactly what Chevalier said to you, and you said to Chevalier on the occasion that you mention on page 22 of your answer. This is one of those things that I have had so many occasions to think about that I am not going to remember the actual words. I am going to remember the nature of the conversation. Where possible, I wish you would give us the actual words. I am not going to give them to you. Very well. Chevalier said he had seen George Eltonton recently. May I interrupt just a moment? I believe it would be useful for Dr. Oppenheimer to describe the circumstances which led to the conversation, whether he called you or whether this was a casual meeting. Yes, sir. He and his wife... May I interrupt... May I interpose, Doctor? Would you begin at the beginning and tell us exactly what happened? Yes. One day, and I believe you have the time fixed better than I do in the winter of 1942-43, to 43, Hack on Chevalier came to our home. It was, I believe, for dinner, but possibly for a drink. When I went out into the pantry, Chevalier followed me or came with me to help me. He said, I saw George Eltonton recently. Maybe he asked me if I remembered him, that Eltonton had told him that he had a method, he had means of getting technical information to Soviet scientists. He didn't describe the means. I thought I said, but that is treason, but I'm not sure. I said anyway something. This is a terrible thing to do. Chevalier said or expressed complete agreement. That was the end of it. It was a very brief conversation. 
that is all that was said. Maybe we talked about the drinks or something like that. I mean about this matter, doctor. Had Chevalier telephoned you or communicated with you prior to that occasion to ask if he might see you? I don't think so. I don't remember. We saw each other from time to time. If we were having dinner together, it would not have gone just this way. Maybe he called up and said he would like to come. It could have been that he called you and you said, come over for dinner, is that correct? Any of these things could have been. Oh, wait, sorry, that was supposed to be wrong. Uh, it could have been that he called you and you said, come over for dinner, is that correct? Any of these things could have been. You said in the beginning of your recital of this matter that you have described that occasion on many, many occasions, is that right? Yes. Am I to conclude from that that it has become pretty well fixed in your mind? I'm afraid so. Yes, sir. It is a twice-told tale for you. It certainly is. It is not something that happened and you forget it and then thought about it next ten years later, is that correct? That's right. Did Chevalier in that conversation say anything to you about the use of microfilm as a means of transmitting this information? No. Are you sure about that? Sure. Did he say anything about the possibility that the information would be transmitted through a man at the Soviet consulate? No, he did not. Are you sure about that? I am sure about that. Did he tell you or indicate to you in any way that he had talked to anyone but you about this matter? No. Are you sure about that? Yes. Did you learn from anybody else or hear that Chevalier had approached anybody but you about this matter? No. Are you sure about that? That's right. You had no indication or no information suggesting to you that Chevalier had made any other approach than the one to you? No. You state in your description of this incident, in your answer, that you made some strong remark to Chevalier. Was that your remark, that this is treasonous? It was a remark that either said, this is a path that has been walked over too often, and I don't remember what terms I said, this is terrible. Didn't you use the word treason? I can tell you the story of the word treason. Would you answer that and then explain? I don't know. You don't know now? No, I don't know. Did you think it was treasonous? To take information from the U.S. and ship it abroad illicitly? Sure. In other words, you thought that the course of action suggested to Elteton was treasonous? Yes. Since Elteton was not a citizen, if it was not treasonous, it was criminal. Is that correct? Of course. In other words, you thought that the course of conduct suggested by Elteton was an attempt at espionage, didn't you? Sure. There is no question about it. Let me ask you, sir. Did you know this man Elteton? Yes. Not well. How had you come to know him? Perhaps no is the wrong word. I had met him a couple of times. How? I remember one occasion which was not when I met him, but when I remember seeing him. I don't remember the occasion of my meeting him. Do you want me to describe the occasion I saw him? Yes, sir. I am virtually certain of this. Some time after we moved to Eagle Hill, possibly in the autumn of 1941, a group of people came to my house one afternoon to discuss whether or not it would be a good idea to set up a branch of the Association of Scientific Workers. We concluded negatively, and I know my own views were negative. I think Elteton was present at that meeting. What was that? I think Elteton was present at that time. That is not the first time I met him, but it is one of the few times I can put my finger on. Do you recall who else was present at that meeting? The list is not going to be comprehensive and it may be wrong. 
I rather think Joel Hildebrand of the chemistry department at Berkeley, Ernest Hilgard of the psychology department at Stanford, there were several people from Stanford, six or seven people from Berkeley. Was your brother Frank there? I don't think so. Was David Adelson there? I'm not sure. I doubt it, but it's possible. He might have been. Yes. Was a man named Jerome Vinograd there? I don't think I knew him. Was he there whether you knew him or not? I don't know. Mr. Chairman, I see it is half past twelve. Would you want to adjourn now? This is a good stopping place now. I think so. We will reconvene at two o'clock. Thereupon, at 12.30 p.m., a recess was taken until 2 o'clock p.m. the same day. And that is where I'm going to stop, too. So, my computer is now down to 36% battery, which is actually pretty good. It started off at 80%, and it's been, uh, like, two and a half hours of live streaming, so... Oh, and I see that the Wi-Fi isn't looking great, so I'll have to review that later, but thankfully I'm recording this, so I'll be able to upload it later and ensure that things are going good. Um, just ensure that there's no clipping so that everyone gets a full account of the transcript without any skips. Um, so I'm sorry if that's been an annoying experience this afternoon. Um, but yeah, uh, so here, wait, I'll see if YouTube, yeah, okay. I don't have any messages from YouTube. Uh, there's stream status messages. So I don't think that there were any issues. So I think that this video VOD is going to be able to stay up, which is good uh, because then the live chat gets to stay up too. Um, but yeah, if anyone else has any questions, for me before I go, feel free to ask. Um, I am not, you know, I'm not in a rush, but that's a good place to stop. Basically, we're halfway through the transcript uh, for for this day. Um, so, yeah, you know, very interesting stuff. Um, here, wait, let me, uh, I, I will switch to uh, this. Okay, I think it's very interesting just to see the intensity of the Rob uh, cross-examination. Like, it's pretty crazy. Uh, he is pretty brutal. Um, and it is interesting. They referenced, you know, a lot of different scenes that were portrayed in the movie. So, yeah. I think that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think this uh, this room is actually pretty good for doing the live stream. Uh, no one has knocked on my door to complain that I'm being too loud, which is good because that would have been annoying. Because, yeah, I picked this room because it had multiple chairs, you know, implying that it's a room that people can, like, talk and collaborate on projects in. So it should be fine for me to use it for a podcast. Um, so, yeah. But, you know, the public-facing window is kind of weird, kind of distracting, so I'll see. I'll probably use this room again, and if not this one, maybe the one next door. Um, but yeah, so... Oh yes, and also next weekend, uh, the stream next weekend, I am going to pre-record it and premiere it and... I will be, you know, checking chat occasionally during the premiere and responding to questions. Uh, sorry to have to do it that way, but I have a very busy weekend next weekend. Uh, I am going to be launching some rockets. So, yeah. Uh, so, I'm going to be pre-recording that one, and it'll go up on premiere, and I'll be in the chat to respond to any questions for that one. Uh, but, yeah. Thank you for being here today and listening to this transcript. I had a great time making this stream. I love reading these transcripts. Uh, it's just very interesting, very fascinating history to me. For the same reasons that the Oppenheimer movie was very fascinating to me. It's physics history. It's, 
U.S. history, its uh, you know political intrigue and controversy and philosophy and all that kind of stuff all wrapped together. And yeah, I find it very fascinating. So with that being said, I will see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.